Um, good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, calling this meeting of the board to order. Uh, I'd like to confirm that uh, members and participated officials are present. Um, so from the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Uh, Aaron Ford. Here. Uh, Steve Revlack. Here. And Sean O'Rourke is going to be joining us a few minutes late. Um, from the town, uh, Rick Valorelli and Vincent Lee, I believe, are both here. Here. And Kelly Lanham is here from the Department of Planning. Here. Okay. Um, is there uh, the applicant here for 36 Surrey Road? We are. You are. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and is the applicant here for uh, 123 Westminster? Yes, we're here. Oh, wonderful. Um, and then appearing for uh, the comprehensive permit for 1165 R Mass Ave. Um, Mary O'Connor, you're here? Yes, Mr. Klein. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Paul Haverty, I see, is here. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Marty Nover is here from Bay Group. All right. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I couldn't find my unmute button. <laughs> I am here. All right. <laughs> okay, so this meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020. This order suspends <laughs> the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And this chair I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. So we're starting this evening um, with Agenda item number two, uh, which is an administrative item, the approval of minutes from the February 16th, 2021 public hearing. Uh, as this item relates to the operation of the board, it will be conducted without discussion by the general public. The board will not take up any new business, nor will there be any introduction of new information on matters previously brought before the board. Um, so the minutes were put together uh, by, <coughs> Excuse me, Mr. Valorelli. Um, I believe comments were received from myself and from Mr. Revelak. Are, were there any other comments or questions from members of the board in regards to those minutes? Seeing lots of shaking heads. With that in mind, uh, may I have a motion to accept the minutes? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Dupont. Second. Second, Mr. Hanlon. Okay, running down the list. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. And Mr. Revelak. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. <clears throat> this brings us to item three on the docket, which is docket number 36486 Surrey Road. <laughs> Turning to the first public hearing on tonight's agenda, some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce the agenda item, I will ask the participants to introduce themselves and to make their presentation to the board. I will then request that the members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been answered, 
I will open the meeting to public comment. So with that, um, if I may turn to the, the applicant for 36 Surrey Road, if you please introduce yourselves and tell us what you'd like to do. Hello, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Akarsh Shalendranath. And I am Sandhya Prabhu. Um, we live at 36 Surrey Road. Um, it's, it's a beautiful house, it's a small house and we've lived there for, we've had it for about four years and uh, we're looking to add an addition. It's a non-conforming lot. So we've requested a spe special permit mm -hmm. to add an addition so that it gives us the ability to have an additional uh, bathroom and, a, and some additional space. Um, I, I'm sorry, I should introduce our architect, uh, Isamu Kanda is with us. Um, uh, I am an economist and my wife's a financial trader. We would know nothing about the, uh, the details about zoning and, and requirements. So Isamu is our uh, support here to help us with those uh, questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, hi, um, should I go ahead and share the, the drawings on the screen? Yes, please. So this is the existing site plan. Um, would, you, would you like us to uh, present this a little? Sure. Okay, great, thank you. So um, yeah, the, this, the proposed addition is, uh, is sort of shown in that shaded area. Um, again, uh, this is a house we absolutely love to bits. We spent a year remodeling it when we bought it um, and, and we don't want to move. So this is it, the only way we have figured out a way to add uh, a, full, a second full bathroom and an additional space in downstairs when our uh, folks visit us back from India and they can't really climb up and down the stairs. Um, so we need some space downstairs. And I don't know what that, that's the, so the, the existing plans. So the, that's the new basement. The basement, new first floor. Yeah, and this is the proposed addition on the first floor uh, with a bathroom and then the den and bed, bedroom. And then there is uh, Go to the second floor. Yeah, the, the second floor would be a a loft space that adjoins the existing house right at the stairs. Um, okay. And then this, this space here, is this uh, open to below? Is that what this Yeah, is? it's open to below. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so. Existing elevations. And these are the proposed elevations. Okay. So the wall facing your adjacent neighbor um, has no openings whatsoever. Um, it'll have a Isamu, I think it will have a window there, right? At the Correct. Yeah, the um, <laughs> the design we've modified <clears throat> a little bit, um, okay. but we have added a, a small window, a fixture window onto that side elevation. At the first floor level or second floor level? On the first floor level. The first floor, okay. And then what is the height of the... Uh, the total height to the highest point of the new roof is about 32 feet. Okay. So this is sort of a, a departure from the, the look of the current house. So I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit to, to the- Sure. What's driving this. <clears throat> sure. Um, so the, 
the existing house, it's it's a gable roof with dormers on the front and the back. Um, so the, the side elevation is sort of like a, a, a book that's been sort of open, opening up. Um, in adding a two-story addition onto <clears throat> this existing structure, our main goal, just for the integrity of the roof and the sort of uh, protection from the elements, was to maintain a new roof line above the original roof um, so that we didn't have to interfere with any of the sort of intricate overhangs and um, um, sort of gable ends that are that are um, existing. Um, so the, the logic being that if we sort of kept the height high enough so we were above the existing roof, we could then maximize the, um, get the proper sort of uh, flashing protection that's needed. Um, if I may just add, this is not an architectural thing, but just in, in the in the rear, which faces to the rare neighbor's house, there is a historic um, uh, garage or a shed. Um, and so there's there's nobody who lives there and we'd be facing that. But it, because it's south facing, it allows a lot of light to come and, and we're not infringing on anybody else's privacy, nor are we, um, you know, experiencing any privacy issues. Correct. Um, yeah, I mean, the existing facade has a certain sort of symmetry um, and logic from the front, view from the street. <clears throat> and we did a couple iterations where we tried to mimic that or uh, even extend that. And it sort of threw the overall composition um, off balance. Uh, and that's where we kind of landed with a, you know, sort of a more of an abstract box. So we don't necessarily compete with the existing structure. And sort of color wise, how does it? Um, color wise, we're proposing a darker uh, vertical siding. Um, that again, you know, the, the existing house is a horizontal clapboard. Um, so sort of complementing that versus trying to sort of compete with it. Um, and the idea is that this um, boxy volume recedes a bit um, when viewed from the street. And, um, <clears throat> Have you had an opportunity to discuss it with your adjacent neighbor on that side? Uh, yeah, the, um, I've sh yes, I've shared all the documents once it was posted. Um, okay. and, and I've had a conversation this morning as well. Okay. Good. Um, then I have a, the only question I have uh, is a question for Mr. Valorelli. Um, so I think we had something similar to this come up on a prior project in East Arlington, where the addition comes out over the existing driveway. Um, so it's you so the, the the area of the driveway that goes past the side of the addition, obviously remains as it is. But the portion of the driveway that is now between the addition and the street is entirely within the front yard. And does that no, now no longer count as a parking space? Actually, Mr. Chairman, the, the, exist, the pre-existing non-conforming front yard would be at the very front of that existing porch. OK. So, so the, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I was going to say, so, you're, so essentially from the front edge of the, from the front of the porch to the street, is what's considered the front yard in this case. That's correct. And that was similar to the case we had in one of the East Arlington requests. Okay. And in this case, obviously that's not large enough for a vehicle anyways. That's correct. That's consistent, right? Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and open up to 
questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I'm just, <clears throat> I'm wondering, uh, wondering about the minimum width of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the minimum width of the driveway. Is that uh, legal, Mr. Valerelli? Uh, so, Mr. Mills, they have to have 18 feet in depth and um, seven and a half feet in an existing condition for a legal parking space. And I believe I went over this with the applicant at the time. There were a couple of issues that were coming close to not making it. Uh, and I believe he does have uh, seven and a half by 18, may even have the required eight and a half by 18. Yeah, we have, uh, we have 10. Correct. Correct. That's all. Thank Thanks, you. Mr. Mills. Other questions from the board, Mr. Revelak? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I took a, took a ride by uh, over the weekend and one of, like, one of the questions I have is, you know, normally for, or for parking in a, resi uh, in a residential, in an R1 or an R2 zone, uh, where the side yard is used for parking, we require a vegetated buffer. Now, the, what I can see the, you know, the existing driveway, and it looks like there are some plants sticking, you know, sticking out of the snow, but um, is, is there an existing vegetated buffer on the, um, you know, the left side of the driveway as you face the, face the uh, property from the street? Uh, may I, may I respond? Please. Yes, um, yes, there is. There are uh, uh, some evergreen shrubs. It's actually on our property, uh, inside our property, but it acts as a buffer. Um, yeah, it's, it's throughout the length of the um, property line up until the shed, existing shed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and another question, and this might be for, um, this would be for Mr. Chilindranath. I hope I was at least close <clears throat> with that or um, you, you got it right. Oh, excellent. Um, one of the things that I caught my attention about the about the house was the facade underneath the front porch and the the stairs. It's a little it's a looks looks sort of like a darker wood, um, very much of an emphasis on horizontal lines. Um, kind of contemporary looking and is that sort of what you were going after with the vertical um, vertical paneling on the addition? Yeah, that's right. That's those are Douglas fir wood. We, we mm -hmm. left it, uh, you know, looking natural um, with some sealant mm -hmm. uh, and it's just aged that way. We're going for something very similar on the, the proposed addition, but it'll have vertical. Um, um, I, I, Isama, what do you call it? Post uh, vertical siding, siding. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, overall, I like it. It's um, one of the things I, I thought it helped do was to um, sort of de-emphasize the the lar the you know the existing driveway, and you know maybe center that centers the building a little more on the lot. So it um, it looks like it it I, I I I like the I like the the proposed addition. I do have a little bit of a concern about um you know the wall uh on the left side of the addition where you know the plan mr klein showed before didn't have any windows but i guess you are planning windows at least mm -hmm. some on that side okay that is all i have thank you thank you mr Alec. further questions from the board None. I'm just going to quickly flip it back. Um, <clears throat> so this is the um, the memorandum prepared by the Department of Planning and Community Development um, in regards to this project. Um, and just sort of quickly going through the criteria um, and the photographs, the recommendation of the Department of Planning and Community Development um, that proposal is consistent with the bylaw and recommends approval of the application. Um, I will go back to the plan and I will um, I will now open up the meeting for public comment. Um, 
Public questions and comments will only be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board um, for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted three minutes each. Additional time may be provided to the discretion of the chair to provide time for questions to be addressed. Chair will ask members of the public who have identified themselves by logging in through Zoom who wish to speak digitally, to please raise their hand using the button on the participants tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. Your audio will be unmuted and you'll be asked to give your name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions will be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the time allocated by the chair has ended, the public comment period will be closed. Board and staff will do our best to show the documents being discussed. Um, so at this time, if there's anyone who wishes to speak um, to this application, if you could please go ahead um, and using the participant, participants tab, raise your hand. This time it does not appear that there is anyone who wishes to speak to this matter. Going once, going twice. And then we'll close the public comment period on this hearing. And if I if I may, um, and this, this may, yeah, this may be more directed um, to Mr. Varelli, um, but in kind of going through this proposal with the um, potential builder, we did uh, sort of think about structural um, ramifications of this addition as well. Um, and so one idea which um, we sort of came up with was if this proposed footprint of the addition were to move back about a foot from where it's currently shown. Um, so basically a foot further back from the front street. Um, that would put the rear corner of the addition at a more favorable location potentially relative to the original um, foundation. And so if we were still able to maintain all the required um, setbacks without um, increasing any of the existing nonconformities. Um, we were curious whether that modification would be um, able to be considered. Uh, so I'm sorry, is this Mr. Kanda? Yes, it is. So that is something you'll have to address with the board uh, tonight because what they're going to approve or not approve is what's in front of them. Okay. So any change, uh, you may ask the chair about that tonight. If it's okay. simple enough, he may, may or may not let you go forward. But okay. I, don't, I don't have the authority to make any changes to a special permit application or a variance application. Okay. So essentially, are you asking to be able to shift the addition back so that the rear line of the addition aligns with the rear line of the house? We, we would move it uh, about one foot back uh, so that it, it actually uh, misses that rear corner, which um, we discovered there's a bit of old plumbing that goes in through that sill. Oh, okay. um, so rather than sort of try to compromise what's existing, we'd rather sort of get one step behind it and, and put in a new foundation um, um, just to minimize any structural considerations later. Okay. So the proposed uh, on the on the site plan right now, the proposed addition is slightly back or you know, slightly forward of the the rear line of the house. Correct. If I can find the okay. So the new so now it's it looks like it's offset by seven and three quarters in front of that so you would be looking to move it to be five and a quarter uh four and a quarter on the opposite side uh roughly six inches actually six inches okay yeah so we can get a full foundation beyond the old foundation 
and that does not impact the um, the the rear yard setback at all. Correct. Okay. It is still more set back than the original rear of the house, um, based on the you know the angle of the rear rear of the lot. Okay. And there's enough, and you'll maintain the ten foot side yard setback. Correct. Okay. <laughs> and then on the front, I think where it says 19 foot three, that would grow to 20 foot three. Um, <clears throat> any members of the board have an issue with putting that in as a condition? Seeing none. Um, so the board has three standard conditions that we would impose on a special permit. Um, one is that the final plans and specifications approved by the board for this permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, this second is the building inspector is hereby notified that he is to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time he deems that the violations are present and the inspector of buildings shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw under the provisions of chapter 40 section 21d and institute non-criminal complaints if necessary the inspector of buildings may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1 and uh number three is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grants are there and then as we've discussed, um, that the applicant um, shall shift the addition one foot to the rear such that it extends six inches to the rear and it maintains a 20 foot three front yard setback and a, and a 10 foot side yard setback. Correct. Are there other conditions from the board? Any other questions or comments from the board? Okay. Um, so where Mr. O'Rourke was not present for the, the uh, for the start of this hearing, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Ford if you would be willing to serve as a voting member uh, for the purposes of this special permit. Um, may I have a motion uh, in regards to the special permit? Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that uh, the, the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals approved the special permit subject to the standard conditions uh, read out earlier and the uh, additional condition relating to the moving of the addition back by a foot. Second. That was Mr. DuPont for a second. Okay, let's do a roll call vote on this. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, <clears throat> so the, the uh, special permit is approved. It'll, um, at our next meeting, um, or soon thereafter, we will have the, the final written decision that we'll vote on at that time, um, at which point the decision will be permanent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's the 
in if there's anyone waiting in the waiting room, but I don't think so. <clears throat> Here's the next uh, item on the docket is uh, docket number 3649, 123 Westminster Avenue. Um, if the applicant can please um, introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Gustavo Pardo. Good evening. Hi, I'm Tina Halfpenny. Great, you both. What is it you would, folks would like to do? We want to build a greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little greenhouse, but um, we've we've asked for permission um, with respect to the variance. I'm not prepared yeah, to so, talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> so we got we got we got a um, we got a. I don't know how far should I go here, and uh, should I tell a little bit of background of what we what we're trying to do, or how, um... sure? Should I bring up the drawings? Okay. So I did uh, share a new set of drawings per your request uh, yesterday, um, the day before yesterday. I hope you got them. Start with so this is the app official application. And then I believe this is the, the information you sent most recently? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so um, we're trying to, um, we're applying to uh, build a greenhouse in our property. Uh, our property is a historical uh, home and, uh, and it follows the guidelines for the historical commission. Uh, so we did start building um, the frame last year in September and, uh, and the historical commission uh, told us that we needed to stop until we get approved from the historical commission. We did the whole process and, the, and they approved it on December 17. Uh, so there are some conditions in our site that it makes um, the location for the greenhouse uh, specific to, uh, to the location that we propose. So first we're in a, our, our terrain has a really high inclination and it has a series of uh, retaining walls uh, to provide some kind of flat surface, but there is no flat surface um, in the front of the house. Uh, another condition that uh, we have is that the historical, uh, um, it's not historical commission, historical? Commission. Yeah. Commission. Yeah, historical commission. Uh, they don't allow any structure that covers the front of the house. So if you go to the next slide, um, it will show different points of view from the street from uh, from Westminster and um, and also the location of the retaining walls. So the only location that we can build the green the greenhouse is on that corner. If we move if you move a little bit um, towards the top of the side, um, the, the pitch it gets uh, it will be pretty hard for us to to build it in that location. Um, there is no light in the back of the house um, uh, because we're at the end of the hill. Uh, so that's the only location that uh, we could build um, our structure. <clears throat> so this is the proposed location which is 12 feet off the front uh, yeah so for... it's, uh, it's 12, 12 from 12 from the front and two six from the from uh, our neighbor from your neighbor so the greenhouse is uh 12 feet by eight feet uh it has no floor uh is is on the ground and um, the structure is, is a wood structure. Wood structure is a wood frame construction. Uh, it's temporary and, and it's um, 
the walls are uh, polycarbonate. And the height is eight feet. Is that what it's going? Uh, it's like it's it's going to be like eight six to the top, to the peak. It has like yeah. uh, what the name of this thing? Well, we're going to put a little ridge um, across the top of it, so that'll be another three inches. But it's decorative. Okay. And you had said um, that the. The reason it could not go up in this area is just is, is lack of sunlight is what you're saying? Yeah, uh, well, so there's a lot of conditions in the back. So we have a, a giant rock uh, and also there is an existing um, shed in the back. Mm -hmm. And then after the shed, there is a, a small um, like walkway. And from the walkway to the first fence that you can see in one of the images that I sent is, I think the pitch is about probably four feet. There we go. So you can, in this image, you can see in the back of the house, they shed. Yeah. And then from that point to the fence, you know, it, it just goes uh, all the way down. The incline. incline is, is, is pretty dramatic in that location. Mm -hmm. And then is this area here, is this a patio? Is that what this is? Yeah, that's a, that's a back patio. Okay. And then um, I don't know if you know, I don't, Mr. Valerelli may need to answer this question. So um, for a corner lot, the two sides that meet the street are both considered front yards. That's correct. And one of the sides is the back and one is the side. And I don't know if that has been established for this property. Do you know, Rick? I I'm assuming I'm, that... I'm Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I, you go ahead. I was going to say, I'm assuming that the side off of Westmoreland being tighter is considered the side and the, the one coming off of Westminster being wider is considered the back? That's exactly right, because the uh, side coming off of Westmoreland would not qualify. It's too narrow. So in okay. fact, they do have two front yards. Okay. Mr. Chairman, one of the points that the Historical Commission said is that uh, the entrance over Westmoreland is considering our main entrance, and we don't use the, the entrance over Westminster. It's, uh, it's, I, I think since we've been here, we probably use it twice, maybe once. Not even the, not even the male uses it. A lot of, there's a lot of steps. Um, so, uh, questions from the comments from the board? Mr. Chairman, I have one comment. Mr. Ford. A question, rather. Um, how are you going to anchor it to the ground? I know you said it's temporary, but are you, are, you, uh, are you anchoring it in any way? Yes, sir. So, wind loads will be, will be an issue since the structure is so light. So, it will have four sun tubes. Uh, following you know, guidelines. And, and the frame has uh, uh, two two by fours uh, pressure treated and it's uh, anchored uh, to the sound tube. Okay, great. That was it, thanks. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. DuPont. So I just wanted to have clarification as to what the classification of this building is because under the bylaw, it's not a shed. And I don't think it's actually a greenhouse either, strictly speaking, because I, I think if I didn't misread it, greenhouse has more of a commercial connotation. And if anybody knows that not to be true, please correct me. However, is this, um, and maybe Mr. Valerelli can speak to this, is this considered just an accessory structure um, on, in an R1 district and therefore it's permissible as a right? Um. It, uh, two, you're asking two questions, Mr. DuPont. So yes, it is a considered an accessory structure. Yep. Um, a couple of reasons. I guess we could say that it exceeds the seven feet in height. Okay. Uh, that's required to be a shed. Uh, to answer your second question, it would not be allowed by right because it, it, it's within the front yard setback. 
Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I think, uh, like the chair said, it's 12 feet off the front lot line. Uh, I do not have the plot plan in front of me. Is, is that correct, Mr. Chairman? That is correct. So an accessory structure is not allowed in the front yard. It would so, have to be beyond the front yard setback as a minimum. So I was maybe misreading this as well, but in the dimensional um, reference, for an Arwen lot, it said accessory building and it said front. And I, I'm talking about the bylaws themselves. And I thought it said front 25 feet and then side six and rear six. So I realized that the rear is not involved in this, but I was wondering, because I think if we're granting a variance, we have to know specifically which uh, section we are granting the variance from. And I just wanted to make sure that that was established clearly. Okay, I believe we're in section 5.3.13. Um, Mr. Chair, this yes. is Mr. Revelock. Yes, I read, I, my interpretation was that this would be a you know, an accessory structure greater than 80 feet um, and it is in the dimensional tables when we get to the the yeah right there <laughs> okay so this would be considered an accessory building or a garage structure with a front yard set required setback of 25 to the front six to the side and six to the rear that's what i was looking at mr valerelli is that you concur? It's the plot plan is saying R1. So if it in fact it is an R1, yes, 25 feet. Okay. That's all. I just wanted to make sure that if we were to grant this, we're going to say that we're giving relief from these specific dimensional requirements. Okay. Are there other questions from the board? Seeing none, um, I will open the, this hearing to uh, public comment. Um, so again, uh, members of the public who wish to address the board uh, will be granted three minutes each. Um, if you wish to speak, you can digitally raise your hand using the button on the participants tab in the Zoom application. And if you're calling in by phone, you may dial star nine to indicate that you would like to speak. So if, there are, if there's anyone who wishes to address this topic, this is 123. Uh, I believe it's gentleman with his hand up, Mr. Um, Mr. Wiesner. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, please. Uh, name and address of the record and... Uh, my name is Paul Wiesner. I live at 115 Westminster Ave. Um, I'm the property owner of um, the property line nearest the greenhouse. Um, so I just wanted to express my enthusiastic support for the greenhouse and I really like the structure and I enjoyed watching Gustavo and Tina build it with their children all over the summer. It was really a delight and um, I was heartbroken when I heard there, were, there might be a problem. So that's all. Oh, thank you. Other, other comments from the public? Going once, going twice. Seeing none, I will go ahead and close public comment. Okay, so back to the board. Um, so this is an application for a variance. And as such, the criteria is different than it would be for a special permit. Um, so the criteria for a variance are established under in state law under uh, chapter 40A. Um, and there are four criteria and all four have to be met. Um, and so uh, the first one is the circumstances relating to soil condition, shape, topography, which especially affect the land or structure in question, but which do not 
affect generally the zoning district in which the land or structure is located that would substantiate the granting of a variance. Um, so this is the criteria, this is the statement from the applicant. I'll just go through the other ones and then we can discuss them together. So um, criteria number two is a literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning ordinance related to the circumstances affecting the land or structure in question would involve a substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the partitioner. Uh, number three is how desirable relief, relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and how desirable relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw of the town of Arlington. Is Mr. Chairman? Yes, please, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I don't have any difficulty with the first and the last two of the conditions. It seems to me that the problem here is related to uh, the topography of, of, of the site and uh, um, which makes it exceedingly difficult for the applicant to do what he wants to do uh, consistently with the uh, demands of historic preservation, which was also an important town policy. Um, it also seems to me that there's no substantial detriment to the public good. It's a temporary structure. It's been approved by the Historic Commission. Uh, I'm persuaded by Mr. Wisner that it would be uh, a favorable addition to uh, uh, the neighborhood. Um, and for the same reason, I don't think that it would nullify or substantially der derogate from the intent or purpose of the bylaw. So I, I skipped over number two, um, which asks to describe how the literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning ordinance <clears throat> um, would involve a substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner. Um, and I wanted to have a, something of a discussion there. Ordinarily, we would not rule that there is a substantial hardship merely because an applicant would be prevented from doing what the applicant wants to do. Uh, and I'm not really quite certain how we could articulate what the special hardship is other than that. Um, and so I would welcome anyone who has a good theory about that. Mr. Hanlon. Members of the board? We might, you know, I also don't have a particular issue with the sighting of it, I think it works. I think it's actually, you know, rather sort of attractive where it sits because the change in elevation, it sort of sits up and it's a little bit, it feels like it's farther back than it is because of where, there, where it has been framed so far. Um, but the, the variance is really there to allow you to do something that you couldn't do otherwise. Um, and I'm sort of struck that if the, that unfortunately, if the applicant really wanted to locate the greenhouse legally behind the, you know, 25 feet back and six feet off of the line, it does appear there's plenty of space up at the top of the site to do so, even though that area is currently um, a shed or currently a patio. Um, and that you know, it would be a hardship for the applicant to, to lose some of that space to the greenhouse. But would it be, would it be sufficiently substantial to um, support the granting of a variance? Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Um, I actually sort of like that theory. Um, you know, substantiality is sort of you know, one, 
vary somewhat with the circumstances. Um, building a major structure here uh, might very well require a higher showing of substantiality than the kind of temporary structure that uh, that is envisioned. Um, and so, you know, in deciding what is substantial, I think that we have to take into account the context. Um, and I think this is otherwise sufficiently in the public interest that I think I would be prepared to, to do that. We do Just have to be specific, the nature of the the nature of the problem is that in order to in order to do something else, in order to comply, you have to essentially eliminate the patio area there, and it makes a it would be certainly a major impact on the value and livability of the house, which seems unjustified uh, by the purpose to be obtained. So we, the Department of Planning and Community Development issued a memorandum on this property. Um, <clears throat> so in regards to the to the variance criteria, um, they agreed that the there are limited areas where an accessory structure could be constructed without increasing or creating a nonconformity. Um, under criteria number two. Um, The, the combined factors of site topography, existing retaining walls, current siting of the principal structure and the requirements of the uh, Historic District Commission restrict the applicant's ability to locate the accessible structure elsewhere on the property. The applicant is unable to both comply with the requirements of the Historic District Commission and those of the zoning bylaw. Um, that the relief couldn't be granted without a substantial detriment to the public good. Um, it's non-permanent, could be easily removed in the future without damaging the property or harming adjacent properties. Furthermore, the district commission has reviewed the proposal and deemed it appropriate for the site in its historic context. Um, and criterion four, a desirable relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the purpose of intent. Uh, proposal complies with definition purposes and the intent of the R1 single family zoning district. There's some additional photographs so you can see. Here's the house as it currently sits. And this is the, the framing for the greenhouse here on the side. Yeah, so that gives you another better. And the re recommendation of the Department of Planning and Community Development is that the Board of Appeals approve the application. So then the question before the board is, does the application meet the requirements of the four criteria? Are there any further questions or comments from the board on those? Seeing none. Um, Mr. Hanlon, would you recommend um, going point by point to the four points for findings or should, do you think we're fine just going straight to a vote? Um, I think we're fine going straight for a vote. I'd like to, I would like to make a motion and, and state specifically that the finding on number two is the way and is sort of a combination of the way the uh, uh, planning department articulated it and the uh, uh, definition of substantial hardship that uh, you submitted in your response to my original comment. Okay. Unless there's further comments from the board, I'll go ahead and have Mr. Hanlon make his motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Planning Commission approve the variance in this case, finding specifically uh, that number one is met for the reasons stated in the Planning Commission, or the uh, Planning Division report, that number two is met for that reason and for the additional reason that 
in order to locate the greenhouse in an area uh, <clears throat> in, an, in an area where it would be in literal compliance with the zoning ordinance would require uh, either uh, that would require the sacrifice of area, the patio area and uh, <clears throat> and other areas that are uh, currently important for the use of the house. Uh, that third and fourth, uh, this is uh, subject to that. This is without detriment to the to the public good, and does not nullify or substantially derogate from the intent or purpose of the zoning law. Uh, again, for the reasons that are articulated by uh, the planning department. And that, that would hold for, that's for both criteria three and four? Yes. We have a motion in front, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. And Mr. O'Rourke has been with us this time, so I will go ahead and include him in the vote. Um, so going so down. Do you, you want me to abstain just to keep it consistent? And you know, oh, that's fine. You are you are you. certainly here before the start. So, okay. but thank you for that, um, Mr. Dupont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Oh, sorry, Mr. O'Rourke. How do you vote? Aye. Aye. Thank you. The chair votes aye. The motion is approved. Uh, so the board will prepare uh, a final written decision to be voted on by the board um, at, the, at our, at our earliest uh, next meeting. And at that point, the decision will be final. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just one question. So we cannot do anything until uh, until next vote? Um, Mr. Valerelli? Uh, that, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. They can't proceed until the decision is written. Okay. And, and that will be... So we're anticipating that... So we have a meeting scheduled for um, March 11th. So we're anticipating that we would vote on the decision at that point. Um, let's see here. Do I have another another earlier no march 11th is the next scheduled meeting of the of the board and i think after, mr chairman yep uh i i believe that this will will be ready by march 11th and okay. uh i do know that mr valerie Melly can comment on this there's there's a period after that vote where the decision has to be filed as well uh and so you have to just sort of wait for that process to take its uh, course, but it's relatively quick. That's yeah. correct, Mr. Hamlin. So um, Gustavo, you're, you're realistically looking at April 11th to be on the safe side, uh, possibly a little bit before. I'm sorry, did you say April 11th? Yes, yeah, about, uh, a little bit before. Uh, okay. Thank you. So we, we cannot do anything on the, on the structure until they put it away. That's correct. Okay. Thank you all. Let's go back to the agenda. This brings up socket item number five, uh, which is a comprehensive permit for 1165R Massachusetts Avenue. Um, Okay, so we are now turning to the comprehensive permit hearing for 1165R Massachusetts Avenue. Um, some want to review the ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. This evening's discussion will focus on architectural and site layout. The submitted documents are available as an attachment to the posted agenda. I'll ask the applicants to introduce themselves, make a short presentation to the board. A fuller introduction was made at the January 5th hearing and need not be fully repeated at this time. Members of the board will then have an opportunity to ask what questions they have on the information that has been presented. And after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. So with that, um, Ms. O'Connor. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, good evening. Uh, as previously mentioned at the January hearing, this project was designed to incorporate the goals and objectives of the master plan, the town's housing production plan, the open space and recreation plan and the Millbrook corridor study. You will hear about that tonight. Um, since that meeting, um, I have supplied uh, the board with a letter dated February 16th, uh, 2021, addressing certain information that was requested by members of the board and the public. And that included shadow studies, tree locations, rider street issues and the like. Uh, this evening, Joel Bargman of BKNA Architects will review the design and uh, provide information as to uh, the site and architectural design and Kyle Zick will address the landscape design for the site. Specifically, the subjects of Ryder Brook, pedestrian, bicycle and vehicular access and safety, parking ratios, stormwater management, wetlands, uh, the riverfront aspects of the and the riverfront aspects of the project will not be addressed as these subjects are slated for subsequent hearings. So I, I'd like to introduce Mr. Bargman, who's the lead architect on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just sharing the screen and checking to see if you can see that now. We can. Um, there's a way to make it. Uh, put it into more of the presenter mode, I think. There we go. And thank you for having us. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, as you requested, I'll try not to repeat what we discussed last time. I have good notes, we think, from our team and we've put together a presentation to address the particular uh, questions that were raised and, and fill in the blanks. Just as a summary of the project, again, it's a total of 140, 381,000 square feet. Um, the residential portion of that is 107,000 square feet. And then there's two levels of garage. Um, you'll see on the site plan that the 90 plus percent of the parking is in the garage. We have 11 surface spaces in 124 garage spaces for a total of 135 spaces on site, 114 bike spaces inside. And that is a topic um, I'd like to discuss later in the proposal presentation tonight to show you how we're parking those and, and counting those. Um, the breakup of the units had been asked for at the last meeting. We have 31 studios, 56 one bedrooms, 32 bedrooms and 13 three bedroom apartments for a total of 130 apartments of which 33 are afford affordable, 97 are market rate apartments. This is in the category of housekeeping a little bit. Um, I think there was a question and maybe a, a lack of clarity on our exhibit last time. Um, the yellow area is the site area taken on an aerial view. Um, th that's the site area for the 40B project. Um, the ownership owns work bar, which is this site, not in yellow, but that's not part of the um, application to the Zoning Board of Appeals. What this little sidebar is showing is, um, maybe I didn't explain it that well last time, is the applicant owns half of Ryder Street as it extends up to Forest Street from the Ryder Street extension that comes into the site. Um, just for clarity, this is a diagram of the entire parcel and then you can see this light blue line is the subdivision of the parcel for work bar that's been removed. The reason we're showing this um, overall diagram is the red line indicates the area of the mill complex. And th those red lines are important because some of the topics that will come up, particularly next week with regards to wetlands, are different for sites that are 
mill sites because obviously they were built in proximity to wetlands, ponds, streams, the Millbrook. And so the state regulations have addressed that. And this exhibit is really to make clear um, what portion of the site is in red is the mill complex site and then the black line that extends out the other portions of the site that are owned, including the extension out to Mass Ave. And that's an aerial photograph that just shows that same map with the current site conditions. We were asked at the last meeting um, to sort of go through the site plan, which um, I did, and I won't repeat that other than to just give a quick overview for any members that are new. The one entry is between a work bar and what's called building two, it comes off of Mass Ave, uh, call that the Mass Ave connector, it goes into a courtyard and you can see the 11 spaces that are surface spaces are these spaces in the courtyard. All other spaces are underneath the building. What that plan does is it increases the, in, the pervious area of the site. And by putting the parking underneath the building, we're able to increase green space on the site by 18,631 square feet or approximately 72% of the uh, green space that's there is increased by that amount of, of square footage. You see on the um, overall site plan, there is some bioswale work and uh, that, that has to do with diverting existing uh, runoff from the parking lot to the north and Kyle Zick, the landscape architect and Bowler, our civil engineer will get into that topic in great detail next week, uh, at the next session, sorry. Just to clarify access, we have traffic coming in from Massachusetts Ave on the portion that's owned by the, the applicant, and I showed in that initial map, um, between the Hyundai dealership and the um, a Butters property, the, the attorney's office. Um, that's entry in. We are widening the road between building two, which I'll explain, and work bar. So that's a two way traffic over the bridge in this yellow area, the drop off, and then one way traffic out Ryder Street and back to Forest. Um, the traffic can exit out and to Quinn Road in this direction as well. But the traffic comes in only off of Mass Ave. What's interesting is that um, we talked in great deal about the Millbrook uh, last time, and I didn't really talk that much about the circulation path that runs along Millbrook. But, um, you can see that this is the Ryder uh, Street extension that connects into Ryder Street and then out to Forest. Here's our main courtyard, and on the right is the bridge. Um, this happens to be most accessible from a uh, accessibility from an MAAB perspective. Um, our path along the Millbrook is flat and um, controlled, whereas you can see in the perspective the grade starts to go up in this direction. So one of the advantages of improving this walkway is not only to connect to the neighborhood and, and to uh, enhance the stormwater management at the edge of the Millbrook, but it also provides us our accessible path uh, for pedestrians of, of the project. Um, I mentioned the entry into the site, and right now I was showing this pathway on the right. This is a view coming down that road um, this happens to be a handicapped accessible path. So all of the buildings within the complex work are new buildings, building one, are all on an accessible path system um, with grades 
that comply with the MAAB requirements. The entry road is now made wider, and I, I didn't really show this drawing last time. Um, currently, it's it's 10, 15 feet wide, and it next down to 10 feet at the bridge, and it's 10 foot for clearance. So it's it's obviously not conducive to uh, emergency vehicle access. So the plan is to remove this portion of the project, widen out that road to 22 feet, and have clear unobstructed uh, overhead condition to get into and out of the site for fire, police, and um, EMT vehicles. I'm not going to dwell on this. I just want you to know that if, if there were some questions about site history, we do have a chapter and can talk about the site history if any questions come up. But in the interest of time, I'll, I'll jump over that. I would like to review the existing buildings because there was some uh, discussion, uh, especially in the Q&A section, open discussion after the, our presentation about the buildings that are being uh, maintained or restored versus not. Um, this is the work bar building. This is the passageway in. Building two is the three-story wood building. Building one is the brick building and the engine room and building three, four, and five. I mean, three and five are these here portions. I'd like to just walk around the site and explain um, the properties. The big picture is that five of the older or the historic buildings in the complex have been or will be preserved and adaptively re reused in this um, project when it's all finished. Um, there are three smaller buildings in the back portion of the engine room that are being removed. And there's also a, a relatively nondescript 20th century infill that's being removed. And I want to just make sure that we're clear what's being kept. This is building one. This is being restored. The, the ground floor has actually got new windows. New windows are in the building ready to be installed that match these ground floor windows. So building one will receive new windows, brick treatment, and interior restoration. But there will not be a major change to the outside of the building, that's a, a really a pure um, restoration project. There is a addition on to building one, which is the building on the right, and elements to the left of that dashed line are being removed. There's this new loading dock that represents an accessibility issue because that and a portion of the floor that goes into the building is raised three and a half feet, rendering that area uh, not accessible. And then you can see there's some new additions on the back side that um, are uh, garage and utilitarian in nature. Just when this portion comes off, I mentioned that building one is restored. That's the condition that it's restored to. This is the white line where the um, building is being removed. That becomes the new entry to the project and then the new amenity space and apartment building is behind that. Okay, here's the corner. I mean, I jumped a little bit fast. This goes up and then turns the corner at this point. So this 20th century garage is one of the elements that is being taken down. It's not of historic value, obviously. Um, that 20th century garage fits into the back of two garage structures that had been adapted over time with overhead doors. Um, this is another view of those two structures, one garage, this is building five. These two structures are being taken down along with the 20th century uh, garage. At this point where the slide runs off, um, the right is all interior garage space nothing of historic value. In fact, there aren't windows and um, it's in fairly poor condition. The 
the end of this building. So I just, I've just walked you on the key plan around the site to this corner. Um, this is the engine room, which is an important space to the complex and is a two-story space actually inside. Um, it's quite a nice room. It's been adapted. The windows have been filled in. The wall has been painted. It really has some merit. You can see it's the one building that has big windows, has architectural detail. So this portion of the building is being stored. And my, my point is that we're taking off some of the buildings that don't really have high value from a development side or historical side and focusing our energies on restoring the buildings that really have value and can uh, add value not only to the complex, but to the public way that we discussed in detail at the last session, this sort of public access park comes along the new Millbrook walkway. And the engine room is on your right. You can see the beautiful windows that were there that were covered in, and then the wall was painted over. So we're gonna do some work to restore that building. And then we're taking out this portion of the garage, and that will be replaced with a new link and then the apartment building seen back another 50 feet from that. Um, this is to show the engine room building and the public access space, and the green space that's created by elimination of this element that really is uh, not of use to the development. And further, it, it obscures two floors of windows in the beautiful corner of building one. So it, its removal enhances building one. I do wanna talk about building two in a little bit greater detail because um, there was discussion about building two. Building two is the one on the south side of Millbrook. It's a three-story building. It's in extremely poor uh, condition. This is the backside um, above the Millbrook. You can see the windows are, are rotted. The siding is coming off. It, it's in, uh, condition. It's been added on to over time. This is an addition for a garage. It was added over the Millbrook and I'll discuss what that's caused in a second. You can see there's a potpourri so of uh, brick, aluminum siding, architectural intrusions on the fabric of that building. So we have corrugated metal, we have hollow metal doors, um, a lot of different things have happened to this building over time. What we're proposing to do is remove exactly this section so that that opens up the Millbrook and allows that public access and private access through there to the, to the new courtyards I showed in that last slide. So this is sort of subtraction giving us a substantial addition to the project. But moreover, when the building is built over the Millbrook, um, what we found is the foundations of this building are in extremely poor condition. And there are two reasons for it. One is the moisture that gets trapped by the fact that the building's built over the Millbrook. And then two, the fact that the building um, was originally designed to be lower than the current site grades. Its current site grades are three feet above the existing foundation. And over the you know, many, many years that this grade has been raised, um, snow and water have collected in that area. And this foundation is in extremely poor condition. The grade uh, timber is in very poor condition and we would really need to be taken out and replaced. Um, the new building fits in the footprint of the old one, but it fills in that edge and um, gets rid of this sort of odd condition, which is actually not that safe of a condition and makes it difficult to get in. But the big problem for us is it, it's created the um, weather problem for the foundation. Inside building two, ceiling heights are uh, below what's allowed by code. This is a 
but not a six foot eight door, which is the minimum door height that's allowed is a six foot four door height. The bottom of the beams is about six foot eight. You can see the, the space is used for storage and other types of functions, but the structure is very lightweight. Um, to use this building um, would require it to be rebuilt because the code simply would not allow a habitable space with these low ceiling heights if we renovated it. And the renovations that would be required for this building would total more than 30% of the assessed value of the building, which would trigger full code upgrade and compliance. So we have a bit of a catch-22 with this building and that uh, in summary, or in length, I should say, is the reasons for why building two is, is slated to be rebuilt on the existing footprint. Um, we were asked on numerous occasions to present shadow studies. Um, we have shadow studies for uh, spring. This is the March 21st um, spring equinox. So 9 a.m. blue shadows are shadows created by the new construction. Black or dark gray are the shadows that are existing today. Um, so really the only shadows that present themselves in the direction of uh, abutters uh, that are residential abutters are those in the morning and the sun's on the east side of the building and the shadows are projected on the west side. And um, even late afternoon, there's very minimal shadow. You can see in the lower right court portion, very minimal shadow cast on the auto detailing building that's next door to building two, which is where my cursor is. Uh, the summer conditions, obviously much better because the sun is in higher point, although at 6 p.m., it's now going later in the day um, because um, trying to give a, a worst case for a, a late afternoon, early evening sun. Um, again, there's some shadow cast from building two. It's not new shadow. Um, any shadow on the abutter is an existing shadow from where uh, cast by building two today. October um, just missed the industrial building on the edge of uh, Ryder Street. And then you can see it, there's shadow cast under the parking lots, but again, not nothing to a butter properties. Uh, December, um, you know, at this point at 9 a.m. on December 21st, the, the sun is very low in the sky and the shadow cast uh, does hit um, the edge um, of, of Ryder Street early in the morning, then by uh, 10 o'clock, that sh the, sun, the sun is high enough in the sky that it comes back. And 12 noon, we have relatively uh, unobstructive shadows. And then in the afternoon, um, the, sun, the sun sets around four on this day. So we, we took three o'clock and you know, virtually uh, um, at that time, the sun again is very flat, presents a, a strong shadow uh, across the parking lot. Um, very quickly here, we were asked to what are the amenities inside the building. As you go in the building, there is a, uh, a conference area for leasing. There's very nice package areas. It, the complex is really designed for getting all those packages and those vehicles out of the way of daily traffic and the not presenting traffic jams. So we have a, a vehicle drop off for uh, FedEx, UPS, and a place for them to bring their packages in without coming into the lobby and make that trip really quickly. We have a lobby that's sort of an interesting combination of new and old. We have very strong connections of the lobby to our outdoor spaces. The building is a combination of industrial past and uh, taking advantage of woods and woodworking sort of in sort of homage to the Schwab um, millworking company that was there after the piano case factory left. This is a 
a paradigm image of what we can do to the engine room and shows why we are excited about um, focusing energy on the engine room, which is a two-story space. We'll be looking for artifacts to display um, and enhance in the lobby. Um, sort of again, that the amenity space will include some activity spaces for residents and a full gym. And it's again, a combination of new and old that we think is conducive to the property. Um, the property is, um, call it episodic industrial architecture. And in other words, industrial architecture evolves over time. And this is the private courtyard. I've shown you all the public courtyards. This is the amenity courtyard that connects to the main lobby. And it really just sort of shows you that episodic architecture is continuing on with our new project that we have building one existing historic building. You have a connector element that's corrugated aluminum, we have a new building and each one is treated a little bit differently. And that brings me close to the end where you had wondered what the materials were on the building. And we'll go around the building very quickly. This is the corner where we enter the parking garage. Um, so it's the westerly corner of building four. This is building one, the brick building. And that's our entry. So we have a combination of different fiber cement panels, which are high quality, um, very durable and maintainable. We have high density wood uh, fiber cement that defines the base of the building where the amenity space is located. This is a blow up of the entry portion of the building and you can see where the wood portion of the building is where some of the metal and fiber cement panels are the entry and then go up three stories and have a little reveal in a fifth, uh, well, four story residential on a two story garage, sort of set back with a mansard type treatment on the roof that's the dark fiber cement. Similar treatment to the rear of the building, again, fiber cement siding. The connector building that I showed is this ribbed metal. So again, it's that sense of episodes of architecture over time, um, different buildings or different materials and make interesting architectural connections, including building one, two, which is a different color, has a different window style and different treatment of the fiber cement. And I know it's hard uh, to present this. What we've done on other projects is have physical samples that we would be happy to leave at Jennifer's office or any other office in town and we could have these well, eight and a half by 11 drawings and anybody that wanted to see the physical samples um, from the board could go and see those physical samples. I mentioned in the beginning I'll do bike storage. We have an amenity bike room that has 42 bikes. We have a garage bike room that's storing 72 bikes and this is a total of 114 bike spaces in the garage. We have outside racks for 22 spaces. What we are proposing is to use this bike system, which is in a project of ours um, nearby. It's a stacking system that allows us to get more bikes per square foot. It's a very popular system because um, these racks very easy to load bikes onto. And the amenity bike room includes the lower right image uh, bike repair facility. I wanted to mention that we are showing 114 bike spaces. If those bike spaces matched the true definition of a bike space per the zoning ordinance or the planning requirements for Arlington, we would only be showing 44 um, bike spaces. So this is one of the um, waiver requests that we're seeking. Um, if we didn't do the stacking bike system here, we also do this vertical stacking system. And we haven't counted it in our space, but the residents have two options. Um, a certain number of spaces in the garage will have storage bins 
over the parking spaces and a certain number of spaces um, may have like storage uh, acts so that folks that have a rented garage space can uh, choose to additionally have other spaces that we have not counted in the bike space, but lots of people like to have the bike stored where they park their cars. So if they go out on uh, to Lexington or Lincoln or Concord and ride back in, um, it's easy to load the bike up. Sustainable design uh, in closing, um, the site gets some significant credits and we understand that we will be doing a lead checklist as part of the uh, submission for a building permit. But we have a very sustainable site from the biking, the pedestrian, and the access to public transportation on either the bike path to Alewife or the bus traffic to Alewife. Um, some of the principles that the project is looking at and in, included in the uh, package you have are the closure of the building, not only the insulated enclosure, which is continuous exterior insulation, but um, the excessive amount of daylight, we are maxing out the amount of windows that we can get with the new energy code, to really enhance the daylighting for apartments and amenity space. And we have really excellent mechanical ventilation, which as you can imagine is important in the uh, post pandemic. Uh, era, and we'll be utilizing low emitting materials throughout that envelope. Um, the building principle is to target a low carbon footprint by um, achieving the prescriptive savings that we can achieve through the new energy code. And um, we will have an energy model that's submitted with the um, ISD submission to the building department. Um, indoor water use. Uh, is hugely important. Um, I'll show you a chart in, in how we're planning to really bring this factor down, not only in the building, but on landscaping with uh, either having no irrigation or very high management of the irrigation system. There will be some EV charging stations in the garage as well, in addition to the bike storage. I'm not going to go through all the strategies, but um, the indoor water use that I mentioned I would come back to um, between the low flow and the low flush plumbing fixtures, um, we're targeting a 35% reduction in potable water use. Um, we will have an active construction management waste, uh, waste management plan for. Uh, a great deal of waste materials generated in the construction process. So that's a very important plan uh, as part of the construction management plan. I think I mentioned the bikes, um, the connectivity, rainwater management, and we'll talk more about rainwater management um, next week, next session. Um, as I mentioned, we have a high performance building envelope with continuous exterior insulation and roof insulation. So we're really targeting um, a low energy and light carbon footprint. Um, and I'm just showing sort of what our target will be for where we're trying to achieve that 35% reduction in water usage. And then in site selection, um, site design strategies, we have a really depth uh, of potential uh, credits that will be applied to that checklist that I mentioned we would understand we will apply with our building permit, including the stormwater design quality control, stormwater design, um, removal of solids, heat island effect, and items that we'll get into in greater detail with our site discussion. So I appreciate being able to get into detail. And uh, with that, I will stop the share and open it to questions and, and other comments you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> the, I had a couple of questions which I'd like to go through quickly and then turn it over to the, the others on the board. Um, the existing chimney that's in the uh, near where the engine room is, is that being maintained or is that chimney going away? That chimney is not being maintained. 
could not tell if it was attached to the building or not, but it, it's farther back. It's not attached to the engine room. It's attached to one of the subsequent the garages behind us. Um, it's it's in very poor condition. It's it would need a tremendous amount of work to be brought up to seismic code requirements, and um, it's sort of in the way of our project. But um, we have had it looked at by two structural engineers because we wanted to be sure about its condition and and. Uh, um, so what portions of the site are open for the public to, to go through and which parts are private? Okay, let me um, go back, back to that, to that. screen share here and um, pardon me to get back to the top. The walkway connects to Ryder Street. So this walkway along Ryder Street's public access comes along the Millbrook. Um, the main courtyard continues. That's open to the public. And then we're removing that portion I mentioned, the corner of building two, which allows us to extend the walkway. And then this is all, this area is all open to the Millbrook path. What is not open to the public is this rear amenity space. This is the lobby and this is the amenity courtyard. And purposely put that there because the building um, really provides privacy for the residents, but any noise that's in there is shielded from the abutters by distance and by the building. So um, that was a purpose for putting our private space there. What's green here is all public. And I will just go back um, to the rendering and make sure I cover that. So this is coming through between building one and building two. That's the public access. And then this is the one uh, garden. And that's the second garden. And that's the Millbrook pathway. And the, the pathway it appears the pathway sort of essentially ends at that point because there's no connection as of yet with the adjacent um, property owner. That's correct. And we understand the Arlington's anxious to make other connections. So um, you know, we're hoping that'll develop over time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so of the, 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 if you could go, so, sorry, if I can have you. <laughs> I didn't mean, I didn't mean to get out, sorry. <laughs> Um, if you could go back to the uh, earlier plan with the red boundary and the green boundary for the property. Yes. So the, the landowner obviously owns these properties. Do they own any of the adjacent parcels? Or are they under different ownership? Well, they're That's under fine. different ownerships. Okay. Uh, they own the work bar uh, parcel. Right. Okay. <clears throat> um, the so for work bar, so work the work bar presently has these two sort of di diagonal structures that go out across the, um, the the river there. What are those? That's correct. Yes. I think we show those. What are they? Are they just struts? Uh, actually, utilities. The utilities are all on the the north side of Millbrook, so that, that building's always connected over that way. That those are not new; those are existing, and those have been there. No, yeah. no, I knew they were there. I wasn't quite sure what their purpose was. Yeah, unfortunately, it's the utility and the. On the site plan, it looked like there might be some kind of a, a wider piece going across that wider white stretch there, or is that just where there is that something going that's across? Not the, a, there's a little structure there right now. Oh, okay. Um, that's existing. Yeah. Okay. The, the new piece is this gray square here, which is the, the new bridge. Okay. 
And then the, the first floor cladding for building two, is that, are you looking to do that with the, again, with the cementitious siding or is that, are you looking at doing that in metal? With, I thought it's that- a, Yeah, that, the first floor of building two is the cementitious, although there is a masonry base that comes down here. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good point. These, these are not cementitious, these are, um, those are either solid, high density fiber cement or metal columns okay. in those, because um, that wouldn't be. Uh, it just sort of, from a, from sort of a, a, you know, a tectonic perspective, it sort of feels, uh, you know, very modern in a way that the rest of the site isn't. Um, and it sort of feels a little bit, a little bit of a high, high degree of, uh, of a juxtaposition against the, you know, the, the older brick um, that used to be, uh, that, you know, is in the surrounding buildings. And, you know, I think that the cladding on the upper floors does a good job of going back to the cladding that, you know, is on that existing building today. I'm just, um, just to encourage you to think a little bit more about sort of that, that metal cladding and whether that um, is sort of the appropriate appearance or not. Yeah, okay, I, that's a valid point. I, I will certainly take a look. I, I, I did, didn't really mention that one of the reasons we have that arcade, I mean, I think it softens up that edge nicely, but it's also that provides the accessible path uh, for the, the, the rear entry to the building and the fire stairs and other things on the building so that we're able to get this um, two yeah. level no, system. I like, the, I like the feature, it's just the, it's the cladding, it's the only. Yeah. Okay, question. that's point well taken. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and then the only other question I think you had sort of half addressed it too is in, in regards to the bike storage, um, the Arlington zoning bylaw requires that uh, bike storage not re be required to uh, lift the bicycles into the whatever location, but I believe you had said that you are providing the required number of spaces um, at floor level, and it's only additional spaces that are going to require lifting? No, I'm sorry, I didn't. Um, I, I said that we're, even with the lifted sta uh, stations, we are providing 114 bike um, spaces, and we, we're not meeting the code requirement the, um, for bike parking. So that's one of the waiver requests. Oh, okay. But I, I will say that um, I know you have the regulation, that project I showed is a project of ours. Almost everything we do is two-story bikes and it's, it's very popular and it, um, it, the, the bikes are so light that we, we really have not had complaints on that system. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did have the picture showing the vertical option, which is allows you to get more bikes in that is an easier system than the stacking, although um, we find folks like the stacking quite well, but you can do a, a vertical stacking as well. Okay, and what, what is the, re the requirement under code for number of uh, 1.5 per apartment, which would be 195 bicycles. So it's, it's a onerous amount of space that we would be required mm -hmm. um, given the number of bikes and in the square footage that's required for each bike. Very good, thank you. Um, other members of the board? Mr. Revelak. Yes, um, just a, a few questions regarding bicycle parking. Um, the fixtures or the racks that you showed the, you know, over under, how high is, uh, how high is the top level? The, you know, you can see it's the handlebar height okay. of the okay. lower. So it's three and a half feet. Mm -hmm. uh, now, were you considering sp any space? devoting any spaces for larger bicycles, uh, such as cargo bikes? Uh, we have space in the building so that if we wanted to have cargo bikes, there's, there is an end space in each 
of our either the bike amenity bike room or the guard uh, garage bike room where you could have a cargo bike okay and finally what about facilities for charging electric bikes and it's a, another uh, quickly developing target um we could definitely have those my my experience has been on our projects that folks don't like to charge the bikes in the bike room because it's too easy to get that battery removed. So I, my experience at least has been people take the bike charger up to their apartment and um, at least on the, uh, you know, on the, on the ones where the battery is easily removable, um, which is on the bat, uh, you know, on the power assisted bikes, not the power run bikes. That's the norm. I guess if it's a power run bike, and not a power assist, then you would have a secure battery and we could have some EV stations. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bargman. Members of the board. Mr. Mills. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I had a question about the main power that we're talking about uh, a main furnace or an energy efficient furnace. Is that true, sir? Uh, are you referring to the the apartments? Yes. The there isn't actually a furnace in the apartments. Um, what we're using is uh, high efficiency uh, hot water heaters to generate instant hot. So they're not running constantly. They're only on demand. And then that on-demand system produces a high intensity uh, heat stream that goes to a coil and that coil then heats the air. So we only are um, doing, the furnace is only on when it's on demand and then we're using water which is, uh, holds its heat longer than air. So it's not really a furnace, it's a, you know, a fluid, which is a, a more high efficiency type furnace. So your <clears throat> root source of power then is electrical, heating this all up. Is that how you... the, the main source for that system would be gas for the instant hot water heater. They don't make a good instant hot water electric <clears throat> yet. Okay, um, I do believe uh, Mr. Chairman there are some new zoning regulations coming out about fossil fuel regulation. Is that true? I, do I think we're still waiting on the attorney general. Mr. Chairman. Oh, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I guess I was the one who, who primarily was presented this to town meeting. Um, what we have is a home rule petition. Uh, so the bylaw that passed town meeting approved in um, in uh, uh, November uh, is subject to uh, authorization by the uh, legislature and uh, can't go forward and, and be legally binding until uh, unless and until that happens. And we're working with our legislative delegates uh, now, uh, our delegation to uh, uh, to secure that that approval. Uh, you may remember that the bylaw uh, and the home rule petition were both the product of the uh, Clean Energy Future Commission, uh, which has been designing a net zero policy for the, for the town, uh, which uh, is in the process of, of being uh, adopted now. And this was one of the first items that they endorsed and as you, you know, town meeting endorsed as well. So I think right now you can say that, that it is not, not a legal requirement, wasn't a legal requirement before this application was filed, will be a legal requirement if we succeed in obtaining the legislation that we are seeking, which is really essentially to avoid state preemption. Um, but the policy under, underlying it is a, power, is a policy of the town uh, as part of its uh, reaction to the challenge of uh, climate change. And uh, if, and to the extent to which the applicant seeks to align its own 
uh, its own proposals uh, with uh, the policies that the town is working to deal with climate change, uh, that this would be a subject matter that they might want to look into as well. I will point out that the ordinance or the bylaw that was enacted uh, had an exemption for hot water heater in large buildings like this so that uh, the only thing it would have affected uh, <clears throat> is the uh, is uh, heating and cooling. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Anything further, Mr. Mills? I'm all set. Thank you. Any other members of the board? Seeing none. Um, just wanted to just invite um, Marty Nover from Beta. If you have any questions in particular, hi, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't. I don't have any questions right now. Um, I'm really. It was really nice presentation. It was nice to see um, the project and um, you know how it fits in the neighborhood. So um, and like like. We we're in the process of reviewing it and we'll be prepared next time to talk about the um, the traffic and then after that, the civil and the stormwater. So I don't have Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll also turn to uh, Ms. Linema. I don't know if yourself or on behalf of your department, if you have any questions you had wanted to put forward. Not at this time, thank okay. you. Okay, um, and just to make sure I've covered everybody, um, Mr. Haverty, I don't know if you have any questions. No questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Chairman, this is Jenny Raid. I, I don't have any further comments or questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. I don't believe there are other. Chairman, Ms. Chapman has her hand up, I think. She does. Get to her in just a second. <laughs> um, so, Ms. Chapman, are you looking to speak on behalf of the Conservation Commission? I am. Um, then I will recognize uh, Susan Chapman, who is the chair of the Arlington Conservation Commission. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the, the presentation. I just wanted um, to say that the Conservation Commission is looking forward to assisting the ZBA in um, responding and, and advising on some of the issues. I know we didn't talk about wetlands or stormwater tonight. However, some of the materials that were posted on Nova's agenda do address these, these items and um, the commission would in uh, the appropriate uh, meeting um, be responding to them. I just wanted to raise one or two just so all of us are, are on the same page and know they might be coming. Mm -hmm. um, one has to do with the requested waiver of the applicant to, um, to the local bylaw for Ryder Brook as a jurisdictional intermittent stream under the local bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, that's something that the commission will, would like to um, comment on. Um, in, in addition, the, um, the stormwater systems, the Conservation Commission has been um, through, through our advocacy towards um, improving flood control, um, requiring of large projects to um, use the NOAA 14 plus precipitation data to size stormwater um, management systems. I just wanted to put that out there also as a, um, a heads up. Um, and the, um, the other item um, I wanted to talk about is we did um, have the opportunity of having a working session with the applicant, which we appreciated this happened in 2020 with the Conservation Commission. We made a recommendation there that the um, pedestrian pathway that's along Mill Brook, and then there's a small greenway next to it 
of vegetation, we made a recommendation that be flipped, that the greenway and the vegetation be closer to the brook to be protective of the resource area and also as a better habitat, small habitat area, um, and the pedestrian area be pushed back a little further away. Um, that was a recommendation by the commission. Mr. Klein, uh, Ms. Chapnick, we did get the message that the commission would like us to use the uh, NOAA data in the stormwater analysis, and we, the um, engineers, are using that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Chapnick. Yep. All right, with that, <clears throat> um, I will now open the meeting for public comment. Um, just to reiterate, public Questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand. It should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing the decision. To provide for an orderly flow to the meeting, the chair will limit individual public speakers to three minutes each and use their time to provide comment related to topics discussed at the hearing. The chair may grant additional time to allow answers for questions. Please note that there are multiple hearings scheduled for this project and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. The chair also encourages the public to provide written comment to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. Uh, the procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for previous hearings. Please select the raise hand feature from the participants tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions will be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps us to generate an accurate set of minutes. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the allocated time has been expended, the public comment period for this evening's hearing will be closed. As noted previously, there will be multiple hearings scheduled for this project and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. And the board and staff and the applicant will do our best to show documents being discussed. If you'd like to have a specific document pulled up during your comments, please ask us to do so. I will go ahead and reopen the comment list. And Ms. Chapnick, I'm gonna go ahead and lower your hand. So if you would like to, um, to address the board this evening um, from the participants tab, please go ahead and use the raise hand feature or style not, star nine if you're on the phone. As of yet, I don't see anyone looking to address the board this evening. We have a little extra time here for people. I'll scan through the pages here in case somebody's waving in their camera, but I don't see anybody waving in front of their camera either. Uh, Ms. LaRoyer. Hi, um, I didn't see the um, raise hand option on the oh. participant panel. But um, so my, my question was actually, do you have a schedule published yet of what topics are going to be uh, discussed at which dates? That is our very next topic. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very interested in the traffic and um, issues and just want to be prepared for that. Absolutely. Just a question, Pat, if you look on the participants tab, do you, is there a raise hand feature there? Um, I'm a co-host, so I can't actually see. Yeah, I can't. Hold on, more. Oh, Mr. Revelak has raised no. a hand. I don't see it. <laughs> yeah. Kevin Klein, um, it's on the bo bottom left of the participants. If you open up your participants and make it a, um, a list on the right side of your screen, the raised hand is on the bottom left. The raised okay. hand, and that's how I do it. OK. Bottom. Chairman, on my, on my screen, it's not actually. It it may be just the way I've I've set up the view, but no. Okay. Yeah, you have to click on participants first. Before. Yeah, I did do that. I did. And there should be on the. I've got it on the right hand side. 
I have mute me on one side and invite on the other. Once you open up the participants, it opens up a sidebar and it, there's a raise hand, yes, no, go slower, go faster. I have the same thing Pat has, so I'm not seeing the raised hand either. Mm. That's okay. interesting. I, I have the same thing as Paul. <laughs> uh, well, members of the public who wish to speak, if you want to turn on your camera and wave, we will keep an eye out for you if you're having trouble finding a One last pass through here, looking through the pictures. All right, seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public comment for this evening. Okay, and then I will go ahead and share those comments. Um, okay, so this we had a meeting um, with the applicant. Um, you can see the list of attendees here um, to discuss the process. Um, so we are currently here at February 23rd, which is the hearing on architectural and site design, which we've just completed. Um, the board has a conference, there's a, not the board, but um, those organizing the hearings, we have a discussion coming up um, to prepare for the March 16th hearing. So the next public hearing will be uh, Tuesday, March 16th, where we will be just at 7.30 PM, where we'll be discussing the traffic impact assessment um, and uh, peer review comments, the traffic impact assessment. Um, Mr. Valarelli, do you know if we have any other hearings scheduled for that evening? We don't. Our next hearing is actually uh, March 9th, uh, a residential matter. Okay. So I think we're okay that evening, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, so that, so the next public hearing on 1165R Mass Ave will be on March 16th. Um, and then the following hearing will be on Tuesday, March 23rd, also at 7.30 PM, where we'll be discussing stormwater wetlands, riverfront aspects of the products, uh, project, excuse me, with emphasis on Ryder Brook and the historic mill. And then after that, the next scheduled hearing is Tuesday, April 13th, uh, where the board will review potential updates to previously discussed aspects of the project. And um, just for those who are following on the website, we understand that the, the zoning board's website on this project um, is out of date. We are working uh, with our uh, peer review consultants at Beta Group to uh, institute a, a document management program so that we will um, have that updated um, in time for our next hearing. Share on that. Go back to the agenda. Um, are there any other preparatory um, discussions on this before we adjourn for the evening? Mr. Chairman, I assume we will discuss the landscaping um, at the March 23rd hearing. Yes, please. Okay. Good. Okay, with that, um, may I have a motion to adjourn to um, March 16th? Mr. Chair, do we? So Mr. Chair, we will continue to March 16th. Uh, second? Uh, second. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Revlack. Before motion to adjourn, do we need a motion to continue? We are doing we that are right now. Oh, okay. May I accept that as a second to the motion to continue? 
Yes, yes, you may. Okay, and I will do a roll call for the board. Mr. DuPont? Uh, aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Revelack? Aye. And then the chair votes aye. We are continued on this until Tuesday, March 16th at 7.30 p.m. Thank you. Well, thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience through the meeting. Officially wish to thank uh, Rafael Lorelli and Vincent Lee for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. And as our understanding, the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. <clears throat> we would also like to thank uh, members of staff at the Department of Planning and Community Development for their assistance in preparing for this and subsequent hearings. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, may I ask for a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved by Mr. Hanlon. Second? Second. Second, thanks Mr. Mills. To a voice vote of the board, all those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Eyes have it. We are adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.